Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week, I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in, and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well, because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast, where we're here to continue to educate so that you feel comfortable investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And on today's episode, if you've ever wanted to know how you could log tens of thousands of miles, and those tens of thousands of miles could turn into potentially millions and millions of valued relationships in real estate, then you're definitely going to want to stay glued to this entire conversation. You know why? Because today's guest not only started by going to university near uh, Lake Erie, he also has a, had a passion for flying as a young child. He was able to live out that passion. He also got to a point where he was able to fly Boeing 757s and 767s. He was able to also meet up one day with a military guy and found co-found Spartan Investment Group that's been featured on Forbes magazine and Bigger Pockets, the Young Entrepreneur Council, as well as Self Storage Association magazine. We are very, very, very honored to, to welcome today the Chief Investment Officer of Spartan Investment Group, Mr. Ryan Gibson. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Billy. Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Great really intro. Looking to this. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to this. Looking forward to this. Hey, uh, Ryan, a couple of questions I always like to start off with. First and foremost, me being based here in Barcelona, we love going long, investing long distance. We'd love for you to tell us where in the world are you today? I am in my home in Seattle, Washington. Uh, shelter in place <laughs> right shelter now. In place. Okay. Well, that makes two of us and we're a nine <laughs> hour time difference away from one another. So, uh, so pretty cool. We love long distance here. And uh, Ryan, help us understand what's the, the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? You know, in the last 24 hours, um, I think one thing that has been impactful to our business is we've got some interest in uh, a big project in a loan. You know, COVID-19 has really slowed down banks' ability to lend. And yesterday, I feel like um, three banks came out of nowhere and wanted to lend to us. So I'd say that's probably the the top of my mind, best thing that's that's been going on in the last 24 hours. <laughs> wow, that's very, very cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that, man. So look, we've got a lot of positive energy, getting ready to get right into it. Um, so a lot of things, Ryan, before we even jump into what it is that you do as the uh, chief investment officer at Spartan Investment Group, really give us a chance to understand a little bit about uh, Ryan Gibson, uh, some of the different decisions you made to help you get to this point in your, uh, in your going along journey. Yeah, so started off um, with a passion for flying and I got a, a career in aviation, um, did a bunch of different things, uh, worked uh, in Washington DC as a consultant for the FAA for a little while. And also, obviously, worked as an airline pilot and did a variety of different uh, roles um, to build my flying hours. I went the civilian route and now just kind of got my dream job um, at a major and always had the entrepreneurial uh, bug or spirit and just focused on things that would help my um, you know, financial freedom, my, my family life, and um, you know, fulfill my passion to really... Um, help others um, achieve their goals um, and mine at the same time by um, starting a real estate company that allows investors to place capital um, in projects with us um, and alongside of us um, so that um, they can have the same benefit and also have a good experience doing it. So that was kind of um, kind of bringing it things to a point today uh, of where we are and um, kind of what I do. So all right, fantastic. So, giving it, getting a chance to live your dream as a little kid who wanted to be able to fly, you had a chance <laughs> to do that. Uh, also, being able to do that the commercial route, uh, also uh, helping others in terms of uh, being able to to counsel others in that space, and then now as the chief investment officer at the Spartan Investment Group, you're able to help others to uh, to understand and work side alongside uh, of your teams 
to be able to derive value for them. So that's, uh, that's great. And there's a lot that we are going to unpack today. <laughs> and I know, I know specifically that, you know, at a Spartan investment group, your big mission, right, is to improve lives through real estate. And that's a pretty big mission. I was wondering if you could help us understand kind of where does that come from? Yeah, where does that come from? Help us understand. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, that, that's a great question. So, you know, when Scott and I, we met each other as neighbors in Washington, D.C. when we lived there. Um, and we got together. Uh, we started off as, you know, friends and our wives, um, you know, we had dinner parties and hung out and just really um, enjoyed each other's company. And when we, there was a house on the block, a couple of houses that we ended up flipping. And, um, you know, our attitude around it was, you know, we're not trying to go out and flip, you know, 400 houses or, you know, try to do crazy volume. We just really wanted to do high quality projects. And every single step along the way, we wanted to find an angle that was a win-win for all parties. Um, so if you go right back to our very first deal, um, or one of our very first deals, we helped a local DC fire woman who had um, inherited a house um, from her grandmother and her aunt. And those um, had both, they had both died actually in a fire. And she inherited this house and she didn't know that her aunt wasn't paying the property taxes and it was going into foreclosure. And we figured out a way to send letters, uh, personalized letters, not just blasted yellow cards or something to that owner. And she got it and she, and it, she opened the letter and she said, Hey, I really need help. Um, I'm getting foreclosed on in tax foreclosure. I had no idea and I have no money because someone took advantage of me and I've lost all my, my money. Um, so we went to court with her and we helped her through the entire process. And, you know, a lot of real estate investors may have moved on to the next deal or whatever. Um, but we ended up saving her an additional $60,000 in tax write-offs and we got a great project. We were able to buy the project at, at a right pri at the right price, um, rehab it through a partnership with a contractor, and help a neighborhood really improve in DC. Um, it was kind of a rough neighborhood, An Anacostia neighborhood, and we made a great profit. And so we just thought, you know, every single step along the way in what we do, whether it's an investor building that personal relationship and giving them a great experience in the investment process by communicating to them on the regular. Uh, sending them reports that are easy to understand and easy to read, um, providing touch points in the um, you know during the their investment journey, or just taking the time to really listen to our sellers and what they want and try to find the win win and not just make it about us. I mean, Billy, you know this in sales, you know it's how can I solve your problem, um, not how can I sell you a product, right? So it's you know you're constantly just you know when a when a seller you know it you know want something, you know, you ask them what they are looking for and then you get really creative and you provide them with that value. And that creates, you know, these raving fans, the investors love the experience, the sellers like the experience, the brokers in that relationship to sell the property like the experience. And, you know, it's just a, it's, you're improving lives because you're improving the experience along the way. I mean, obviously we, um, you know, donate time and money to charitable organizations. Um, I specifically do a brain research foundation uh, contribution every year. Um, and, you know, we do things with, um, you know, helping veterans, you know, Scott is a disabled veteran um, and we donate to a veterans auction every year um, in here that, that's put on in Seattle. So, you know, we just, we, we do everything we can to look for the angles. And now that we have 22 employees, you know, we're trying to create an environment that people really love coming to work. And, you know, Scott and I worked in the corporate world for, you know, a long time, you know, 10, 15 years. We know all the things that drove us crazy about work <laughs> in the corporate world. So we're really trying to deliver to our employees, you know, uh, we give everybody a season's pass for skiing. You know, we have flexible work hours. Uh, you know, whenever we have a meeting to brainstorm ideas, uh, we invite the entire team, everybody from the CEO down to the intern. Um, so we really want to try to provide an experience and create a company that's brand and its mission is to just have, you know, ha ha have a good time, you know, obviously and improve lives, but, you know, also, you know, be profitable um, and be high performing. 
So that's really what, um, you know, that improving lives through real estate started with that one deal. Um, but it's really just every single project since then, um, you know, we just take the extra step and I'll even say one more thing, you know, when we're working on a project and there's neighbors involved, you know, I, you know, our team always goes the extra mile to knock on the door, get to know the neighbors. So when we have a development project, they're, they're on the same team as us. They're on the same page so that there isn't any type of confusion or, you know, we always ask this, you know, we always ask the neighbors, you know, what, what can we do to help make this experience more enjoyable? And if it's something reasonable, you know, obviously we'll go out of our way to, to accommodate that. So it's just created a culture of, of just making sure that what we do is in, in adherence to our mission and our values. And that's what we've made our company all about. Well, I think that's great. I mean, being able to just hear over and over just the fact that you're really focused, uh, both yourself and Scott, on driving a culture and, and a mission that is focused on improving lives. And whether uh, it is the the person that you helped with the with the sixty thousand dollar tax write off <laughs> in 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 DC, or your team and having them involved, making them that understand that they are part of the experience that is happening and that they, is part of the culture that you're that you have created um, at Spartan Investment Group. Um, that's internally. You're also now explaining how you want to continue to positively affect through the right experience with potentially new um, new people that will be impacted by positively impacted by your your investment uh, projects. I think it's phenomenal. So we get a sense of that going uh, throughout each one of those uh, examples. So you know, and, and when you're talking to me about the experience, I think it's 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 really interesting, right? Realizing that when we think about Spartan Investment Group. 2017 was your first, uh, let's say your first big project, uh, if, I, if I've understood correctly, it was your first big project in the self-storage space. And having gone from a point where you were at five employees to just a few years later, you're more than four times that. And also in terms of the overall number of assets that you have under management, which is probably close to 100 million uh, in yes. that area. And, and also being able to raise capital from your investors, which are more than 1600 at this point in time, there's a real focus on the experience there and being able to have this hyper growth. And then your focus is in an area that's probably not really well known to a lot of people outside the United States, which is the self storage space. So yes. Talk to me a little bit about that because it's, there's not so many people involved in self storage, if I understand correctly. Sure. So, you know, I think, I think America is known for its uh, stuff. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and our inability to control, uh, how much stuff we buy and, um, and, and our, in our belongings. And it seems kind of ridiculous and far fetched. And even to me, it feels that way because I'm the type of person that doesn't like to have stuff laying around. I mean, I've lived in my first, our first apartment in DC in Georgetown was a 400 square foot apartment. And then we upgraded and doubled our size to 800 square feet when we moved to Capitol Hill. And then, um, only recently did we kind of buy a larger house in Seattle that, um, <laughs> you know, is more than, uh, more than a couple of bedrooms. So that's good. Um, <laughs> but, but we, we really, you know, it's unrelatable to me, but it's a, it's a data driven industry. And, you know, when you look at the numbers and you look at the spending and the $38 billion industry that self storage is, it becomes real clear fast that, you know, this isn't just, an idea or a new invention or anything like that. This is something that's real. Um, there's over 2.3 billion square feet of storage in the United States with an average occupancy of over 95%. So when you look at, you know, the, the utilization of self storage is very big. Diving into why people use it, people don't just use it because they have too much stuff. Um, people use it for a number of different things to include little league baseball teams, uh, rec you know, recreational vehicle storage, equipment storage, general contractors, home renovation specialists, dog walkers, Amazon, Etsy, business people. You know, there's a lot of different reasons um, why people use storage. And it depends too on kind of the area, but there is a number of different factors. I mean, I'd probably say 30% of our business comes from businesses. Um, and then also a big factor in storage that's um, on the rise is last mile logistics. So, you know, an Amazon, you know, ships from a half a million square foot facility, you know, a um, hundred miles south of Atlanta, Georgia, let's say, and they got to get it to the downtown. And there's some, there's some inner exchange of, you know, well, this, these packages are going here, those packages are going there. 
Amazon necessarily doesn't rent from us, obviously, but there are a lot of companies who have to compete with that and they have to have those last mile uh, logistics squared away. And sometimes that means using a storage facility uh, to, to grab those um, packages and get them um, kind of point of sale really fast. Um, so that's kind of, you know, self-storage, you know, the average utilization for self-storage in the United States, I know there's a lot of, st- there's a lot of statistics, uh, is seven square feet per person. So if there was a hundred people, uh, there would be a 700 square foot demand. So we can look at a property and say, okay, we can look at data and see that the demand in that radius around that one facility's location is X. You know, if there's 10,000 people and the demand is seven square feet, square foot per person, we can see it's 70,000 square feet. And we can look to see if there's other facilities that exist in that location, subtract out that supply and determine what our ultimate demand is. So it's a very data-driven um, industry and very uh, very highly you know, lucrative in the US. Wow, so, so there's a couple of different things, right? So there's number one, just culturally, because we, yes, like to accumulate <laughs> stuff. And you can ask my wife who's Spanish and well, I'm not. So <laughs> she, she, she would also agree with you and I'm doing that in our uh, flat here. So, <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is it's a $38 billion industry. So that is that speaks to itself. Two point three billion in terms of square footage uh, available and ninety five percent utilization utilization rate, which means that well, there's ninety five percent of what is available is being utilized, and when it's being utilized, yep. it's being paid for. So yep, that's uh, if you want to look at data, uh, data. Well, then that's something that's uh, very nice. And when you talk about the last mile, so there's also not just for individuals for com- for personal use, but also for those businesses that you talked about in, in giving that great example of the last mile. So once they get close to a major metropolitan statistical area, say that three times fast, uh, yeah. they need a place to go uh, to MSA. To, yeah, the MSA. So to be able to take it to, uh, to, the, to the very last mile. So, um, so that's really, so that's interesting. So when you talk about the, the, the data driven part, right? I guess as the chief investment officer, kind of help us to understand when you are helping to educate the, those over 1600 investors that you have to really get their head around what are some of the different things that they should be taking into consideration uh, when they're looking at what could be the potentially the right project for them. I would look at population growth, job growth, rental rates, And um, if the opportunity came with a demand study, what the unmet demand is or what the surrounding occupancies of the existing facilities are, I'd also compare the pricing of those existing facilities to the pricing of the current facility that you're looking at investing in or that you're investing in. Great example. Um, we, We may be buying a facility that charges $80 for a 10 by 10 unit, 10 by 10 unit being 10 by 10 feet wide, 100 square feet. It may be eighty dollars, but the competitor down the road may be charging one twenty, and they're full, right? So now you have a rent increase opportunity, mm-hmm. and then I would look at you know the operator and what market study they did and see, okay, the market is ninety eight percent occupied. You know your facility is seventy percent occupied, and the reason why is presumably because you know they don't have the internet, they don't have anybody answering the phones. It's an absentee owner. They don't have the proper signage. The facility has been worn down. Um, they're not doing targeting ads. They're not uh, promoting their business online. Uh, you know, a number of different things. So I'd kind of understand the opportunity as to how that operator is going to reposition that asset so that they can uh, get, what, get what they deserve or more in the market for occupancy. And then what that does to the numbers when you do that. So you know, then I would look into an underwriting file and see that, you know, hey, when you increase these rents, you're going to have a 30% margin on the purchase price of buying the property. Or maybe that operator is going to add more units. That's what we do. We buy a property that is got vacant land. And then we add, we make sure there's enough market demand in the, in the market that we're looking in to add on those units. And then when we add those units on, um, you know, that market demand gives us our ability to lease up those additional units and acquire more customers. You know, it's not just a build it and hope it's a, it's a study the market and, you know, understand that you have demand. So those are just a handful of things I would look at. And then obviously the operator's experience in doing what they're saying they're about to do, if they have no experience doing it, you know, that might be a 
a pause for, for consideration, but you know, not, not the end of the world sometimes. I mean, sometimes a deal's a deal. But um, you know, I'd look at the team and their ability to execute. So, okay, fantastic. So, I mean, a lot of the things. So, re- rental rates, population growth, uh, de- demand, demand studies. If those are are there, you talked about also looking at just the under underwriting, and then it goes back to another element that's really important that you're talking about, which is team, right? And I know yes. that you all have done over nine projects from from big, uh, soup to nuts, as you would say, kind of the beginning to end. And so, um, I think th- those are some of the things that you definitely want to keep in mind. Now you talked about something else and I know that of your uh, over 20 employees that you have that geographically you are, you're today in Washington, but I know that you have multiple offices uh, in the U S and also one of the things that's important to us here with at the going Long podcast is you're not doing this in Washington exclusively. So give us an idea today, kind of where Spartan investment group, where are you investing and uh, yeah, and, and I guess it would follow some of the, well, follow the, the process that you were talking about, but give us an idea geographically where you are today. Yeah, sure. So in Washington, we have about a thousand units under development right now. We're building uh, just under 800 units of storage in Seattle. And then we have a mobile home park, which is kind of a, a deviation from our storage business uh, that we're building in the Olympic Peninsula, just outside of Seattle, about 217 lots. So those are, that's kind of our Washington projects. Um, when we, a lot of our focus, um, a lot of our projects happens to be in Texas. So we have three properties in the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, totaling, uh, just over 2,500 units. And then we also have, um, two projects in West Texas. Um, those are RV parks. Um, so we have, um, again, kind of operations in West Texas. We have about 200 and 30 or 40 pads out there. Um, and then we have two self storage facilities in Colorado. Um, so we have Colorado, Texas, and Washington for our projects at this point. Okay. We do have a project in Michigan, but it's more mostly just a passive investment than it is uh, our own operation. Okay. So you're seeing where the opportunities exist, going back to some of the things that we talked about before, the demand, you're looking at the, the those specific opportunities. Are there, is there job growth? Is there population growth? And you're moving in the areas regardless of the geography. Yep. So yeah, in the re, and there's a reason for that. So if you go to spartanmap.com, um, that's on our website. Uh, we've already, we've gone through the entire United States, all 4,000 or so MSAs. And we've narrowed down the 150-ish markets that have the best population growth, job growth, demand growth, um, and price per square foot for storage. And we've narrowed down those markets, uh, macroeconomics, you know, of, of kind of macro markets. And so when we are getting when when we get a deal, in the and it's in those markets, those target markets that we're looking at, we look at it. If it's not we kind of pause and make sure that there isn't something like incredibly special about it. And if there is, you know, we might take a little bit more of a look, but otherwise we're looking to get rid of that deal, just throw it in the trash. Um, the reason why we look in 150 markets, you know, some, some operators may only be in like one market. You know, if you're looking at multifamily apartment investing, you may have enough deal flow in that one market to have the, enough deal flow for you forever in storage. There is only 55,000 facilities in the United States. Now, that's more facilities than Starbucks, Burger King, and McDonald's combined, right? That's more locations. So it's very, very popular, but also um, multifamily. I mean, there's millions and millions and millions of multifamily properties. So we have to look far and wide to get the deal flow um, that meets our buying criteria and the best markets. And that's basically how we focus our, our uh, investment selection. Okay. And, that, and that, that's phenomenal. And I just want to highlight something because what you just shared with us was, um, it was like a super secret ninja trick more than anything else. And you should be going to spartanmap.com because <laughs> Brian has just helped you a lot because he, we just talked about 4,000 different MSAs. He's taken it down to the 150. He just saved you 96% of your time for looking for something else. So thank you very much, Ryan, for that and uh, much appreciated. So, and, um, I, and I will caveat that, that those markets are looked at through the lens of self-storage. And here's a great example. So 
we don't look in California, um, but like a multifamily investor may shy away from Seattle because of rent control and and you know things like that. Um, you know, we we don't have that problem in storage. So you know, when you have to evict a tenant in a, an apartment building, you know, in some markets it could take you know like Washington D.C. it could take you a year to evict a tenant. In storage, it's only thirty to sixty days. And here's the you know the three reasons why I think storage is bar none going to be the best investment over the next 24 months post COVID because we, (laughs) we rely on life events. So displacement, divorce, downsizing, moves, relocation, job relocation, all of those events trigger storage events. And the reason why storage is going to be the best investment for the recession is because that's about to happen a lot. You know, we're going to have, unfortunately, job displacement in the United States. That's going to trigger moves. We're going to have um, relocation. Unfortunately, we're probably going to have a divorce, especially after being in, in quarantine uh, for so long. Yeah. Right? I mean, I hate, to, I hate to joke about it, but it's true. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you have all of those disruptions, downsizing, and unfortunately, you know, today there was another 4.1 million job loss claims in the United States. That 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 that's going to lead to downsizing and people are going to have to put their stuff in storage and you know those things are are, are apparent and so the reason why self storage was the least foreclosed upon asset class during the last two recessions was because it relies on those life events the other thing that um i think makes storage uh, a very powerful investment is that we have a lien against the folks b- belongings so our collateral, when somebody rents from us, it's, this is kind of a wild concept, but if someone rents a unit from us and they put their stuff in our unit, we have a lien against their belongings. So if they don't pay, we have lien, lien protection to, fa- to auction off all of their belongings in the unit as collateral for not paying rent. And whatever we can earn from an auction to do that, if they don't pay, then we keep that profit and then uh, to cover the expenses that we lost uh, for that unit. So Perfect. we have a, yeah. sorry, just on, on, on that one thing, I just would, uh, if you can help us to understand for our non U S uh, yeah. <laughs> listeners and, and audience, when sure. you talk about a lien, can you help them understand what that means? And sure. So if I, yeah. So if I buy a car and I borrow money from a bank to do that, um, the bank is going to put a lien or a, a loan against my property, my, my vehicle. And if I can discontinue making my monthly payments on my car, the bank can come take my car away from me, right? So I put down a little deposit. I put down, you know, a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. But if I don't make those monthly payments, the bank can come take that that car away from me because they've got a lien against my uh, my car. It's no different than in storage, you know. Unlike multifamily or any other asset class, really. You know, they don't have, you know, if a tenant doesn't pay, they have rights and they have laws that protect them from being displaced or kicked out, especially during COVID. You know, COVID is getting even more stringent where they're having uh, rent waivers and eviction bans and all these other things. None of this stuff has touched storage. So basically, if you've got your stuff in storage and you don't pay, we auction off your belongings. We use the lien, uh, the lien rights that we have um, that's in the property lease and can uh, auction off your belongings and, and get your unit back. So that's, I, I think th- those are kind of the, you know, and the, the third thing is we're an essential business. So we're not closed. Um, so a lot of businesses closed and that really is going to help drive um, a lot of, you know, revenue to our, to our business. We haven't seen any impact as an industry. I've been, uh, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, micro examples of how people were impacted here and there. But, you know, I'm reading, I just got another Marcus and Millichap study where they've surveyed operators and there is very little impact, very little hits to revenue. Um, the move in, move outs have kind of gone to basically neutral. Um, nobody's really moving in, but nobody's really moving out yet um, because a lot of people are shelter in place and they can't go anywhere anyway. Um, but, you know, delinquencies are, are down. Uh, people are paying on time and occupancies are still very strong. So delinquencies down, occupancy strong, people paying on time. And it's been, from an asset per- perspective, the least foreclosed upon in the last two most recent down, uh, down um, recessions. Yeah. Recessions. Thank you very much. That's the word I was <laughs> looking for. And so the fact that you are expecting 
life events to happen. That's one of the main triggers. I mean, of course, that is one of the things that is happening and will continue to happen over the next 24 months. So um, I guess this would help us to, to understand <clears throat> Also, one of the questions, and I know one of the strengths that uh, that you have in terms of being vertically integrated, and basically, so I know if you think about long distance, maybe it's you're working with a different company. I know that you all happen to do it a specific way. So maybe if you could talk to us a bit about how you're organized to be able to best serve your your tenant, your your uh, customer, as well as your investor. Yeah, sure. So. You know, we probably have 5,500 customers if you really boil it down for over 4,000 units. And then over, we have about 200 active investors, 1,600 investors on our list. So we have a lot of customers. So the reason why we picked self-storage as an asset class, not only was it recession resistant, because it was easy to evict, easy to maintain, easy to operate. So when we went on this journey in real estate, we wanted to have control over the whole process because we know once we start third party this, third party that, we lose control and we lose the quality that we want to have echoing through our entire organization. So storage was one of those things where I was like, we could scale this business and still maintain all control of the operations. So at our corporate staff, we have about 11 people. Um, we have, we have uh, folks focused on uh, asset management and property management. Uh, so we have um, that department focused on the property level staff that we directly hire and they're Spartan employees now. Full benefits, uh, paid by Spartan, Spartan employees. So they're, they get trained by us and they get um, all the benefits that a Spartan gets. So at the property level, they report directly to us. It's not you know, a property management company that hires um, you know, their own staff and has their own you know, culture and ethos and all that stuff, right? Now, we have one property that unfortunately we were imposed upon the bank to have property management for at least a little while. Um, but otherwise, we can manage directly all the way through the organization. So if an investor asks me a question about, hey, how's this property doing? I can literally tap the asset manager you know, on the shoulder and say, hey, what's going on with this property? I want to know details. So we have the information and that's why our communication, I think, is so strong with our people because we can real time, you know, not, you know, I'll ask this person and that person has to ask this person. It's an external organization and the answer you get is not going to be satisfactory. Then you got to go back through the channels, right? We, we wanted to get rid of that. Remember, we wanted that corporate environment that didn't have that. So we have um, really good cross uh, department communication um, that allows our investors to have the information that they need to feel comfortable that we're doing everything we can to run a good investment. And that aligns us with their interests. You know, with a third party property management company, they care about one thing, a percentage of gross revenue, right? Gross, not net. So we look at the net profit. That would, that's what really earns our investment. Um, it's, it's best uh, return is the net profit. So uh, we can control the whole value uh, when we do that. Okay, so that's one of the that's one of the main benefits being able to do that having having better control, being able to once again deliver on, on your mission statement, which is to improve lives through uh, through real estate. So um, I think it all comes back full circle. And yep. <laughs> you, you know, Ryan, there are so many things that I would love for us to be able to get into. I'd love to be able to invite you back so we can go into some of the uh, probably more more of the detail and things like that. But um, you, you've helped us to understand so much about. Uh, Spartan about yourself uh, as well as the self storage space, and what I was hoping to do is kind of get us to take it home and and ask you the the final three questions for the uh, the going long final three is what we'll call them I guess. You ready for that? I'm ready. All right, cool. So the with me being here in Barcelona, I always want to know uh, living here in Europe, <laughs> what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or it's on your bucket list to visit. Well, we just went to Croatia and uh, I don't know, that was pretty, that was pretty awesome. I love going to, you know, we've been to Paris a lot, you know, it's a lot of fun, um, but uh, we love Croatia. We really went to Dubrovnik and it was, it was amazing. We went down into Montenegro and uh, just love that area of the world. Uh, it was just beautiful. Dubrovnik, the history, the culture, the people. Yeah. It's just amazing. Uh, very cool. So perfect. So Dubrovnik, if that's okay, we'll we'll put down for sure. We'll for final answer, answer for today's answer. And <laughs> the and so I guess <clears throat> throughout your career, you have made I don't know many mistakes. Let's just call it that. And you paid full price for those mistakes, Ryan. And so, what would you do? What I guess what advice would you give to someone else 
uh, as you pay it forward so that they don't have to pay full price for the mistake that you made. Um, you know, you'll hear about syndication, you'll hear about investment opportunities in real estate. Um, don't chase the deal, chase the team. That's my number one piece of advice. You know, I, I always joke the a famous quote, my grandfather says, um, money makes the blind man see. And, you know, if you're just new to this game and you're thinking about investing and somebody shows you a deal and you see, oh my gosh, wow, I can make that kind of money. Uh, you know, you, you weren't even thinking about something and now you can see that you can make money in that and you start chasing the project, you start chasing the deal and you don't even pay attention to what really is going on with the team and their ability to execute. So take the time to, you know, I, I always say passive inve passive investing is active investing because you actively still have to spend time finding an operator that has the same alignment of your values and the expectations of communication. An asset operator, you know, if communication is important to you, just say, hey, can you send me the last three communications you sent to your investors <laughs> as a way of like actually seeing what it's like? Um, you know, ask for every single project that they've done, that they've personally operated, not what they've invested in, but what they've personally operated and the results of those projects. You know, really get to understand a team let some pitches go by, let, let some deals go by and don't invest. And, and then when you're ready to make an investment decision, um, you know, and a deal comes, you know, you've got your team vetted, you've been on their list for a while, uh, then, then make a decision. Don't just, don't just rush in. So I, I think that's probably, you know, I made that mistake when I first started passive investing, I was like, Oh, this is really cool. I can invest in apartments. And I did. And then the deal went really badly. <laughs> so, and later on I was like, Oh my God, when I learned about the operator, I was like, I cannot believe I invested with this person. This is, I'm very disappointed in myself, but you know, I was chasing the deal and not necessarily the team. So there we go. So chase the team, not the deal. Thanks for sharing <laughs> that. So somebody else doesn't have to pay full, full price for that, uh, for that lesson. And then lastly, the third question is I know you like to read and many of us would love to know what it is that you're reading or what book you would recommend others read. Right now I'm reading the book, Small Giants. Um, I haven't finished it yet, but it's very interesting. It's, uh, it's about companies that are choosing to stay small, um, but also very high quality. And I kind of, what me and Scott really relate to that where, you know, we always get you know, the opportunity to grow our portfolio to a billion or whatever, or hire all these people or whatever. But we're really, you know, we're, we've never really been motivated to grow. We've just been motivated again to have high quality processes, people. And of course we've been growing and it's been a lot of work, but you know, it's like, you know, every once in a while we kind of pause and we're just like, man, I think this is just kind of happening a little bit more, you know, cause there's more, so much more to life than just your business, right? You want to set up your business so you can do things with your family and do things that you're passionate about. And I think that Small Giants is really relatable to that. But I, I think the one book that sort of made everything click as a, as a high income earning W2 employee um, prior to really pursuing real estate investing was Cashflow Quadrant. You know, I think just really bracketing, you know, hey, you're a sell, <laughs> it's up on the shelf, um, you know, really saying, okay, W2 employee, right? That's, you know, you're going to exchange time for money or you're going to be self-employed and that's, you know, that's good income, but it's very stressful. Um, or you can be a business owner or an investor. And I, you know, I want to, you know, with a business, you can create the most value as an investor. You can have the most um, enjoyable experiences, right? If you can, if you can go into that corner and you pay the least amount of taxes. So I really like the cash flow quadrant because it put into perspective um, sort of where I was in my life and where I wanted to go. Okay. Awesome. So we'll, we'll let you get, go, get by with two today. So small giants as well as cash flow quadrant. <laughs> yeah. uh, awesome. So listen, Ryan, you've shared so much goodness with us today uh, from, like I said, in the beginning, being able to follow your dream, live that dream. You're, you're now, you found a new dream. You're continuing with the Spartan investment group. You are growing your business um, fourfold in less than you know three years. Uh, you have a wonderful strategic vision and strategic plan for 2020, 2022. Uh, so hopefully one of the things that we'll, we'll be able to talk about here in just a second. And you've given us lots of information, data points to think about uh, self-storage as one of the asset classes that is very much uh, recession-proof or uh, recession-resistant, better said. 
And uh, really want to thank you so much. And because you shared all this goodness with us, I'm sure that there are lots of people just like me thinking, how in the world can I figure out how to get in touch with Ryan Gibson, how to learn more about Spartan Investment Group? So can you just help us really understand how in the world can we get in touch with you and quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So our website, uh, thanks for that, is uh, uh, Spartan. hyphen investors.com. So Spartan, S-P-A-R-T-A-N hyphen investors.com. Um, you can also reach me by email at uh, Ryan, R-Y-A-N at Spartan hyphen investors.com. Awesome. So, and one of the things I would say, you, you, I know that you have talked to us a lot about your focus on experience, your focus on really helping others uh, to come up with solutions. I would recommend highly that you do go to, um, to the website, to spartan-investors.com. Lots of great information, great videos, uh, and really gets a great sense of the type of high quality culture and experience that you're looking to provide for your prospects, for your uh, investors, and those that are really just interested in growing their education. So uh, definitely say go to do that. And as Ryan already said, if you wanna reach out to him directly, you can go to ryan at spartan-investors.com. So uh, Ryan, it's been a real pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Really looking forward to having you back as well to uh, to share more goodness with us here yeah. on the Going Long podcast. And for those of you that are watching or listening and you found a lot of value, I'm sure you did, feel free to go ahead and share this with at least two of your other friends so that they can also become part of the community, learn more about what it is that we're doing here, and we can continue to grow with like-minded people. So uh, once again, it's Billy Keels with the Going Long Podcast, and really looking forward to you meeting us and being here for the next episode. Thanks so much, and make it a great day. Wow, don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode, so go out and make it a great day.